praises to our King. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're just going to sing His praise and give Him the glory that He is due. So we invite you to join with us as we sing this morning. our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, Hero of Heaven, you conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things, we dance in your freedom, awake and alive, oh Jesus our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You have done great things. Yes, God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven. The grave, you free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. I sing, you've been faithful through every storm.
Praise the name of the Lord, for he has done great things. Amen? Amen. I've just been reminded over the last little bit, we had our series on Colossians at the beginning of the year, and I just think about these words from Colossians 1, that he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. That is our king. That is the one whom we serve. That's the one that we rejoice in this morning, that he is the firstborn over all creation, that all things were created by him and for him. And so we serve Jesus this morning. Amen? And so we're going to sing a song that just testifies to that. We've done it a couple of times, so it might be just a little newer. But I think if we can just focus on these words about how great and mighty our God is, I think they give us such hope. And so, Lord, in this moment as we are gathered in your presence, we pray that you would just shine through. You are Jesus, the one who has come, the one who has delivered us from the domain of darkness. And you have brought us into your kingdom. And we are so grateful that we get to be in your presence. So today, we pray that you would help us to experience you. To sense your nearness. And we just call on your name, Jesus. Knowing that you are strong and able. only one strong enough to save there's only one who overcame the grave there's only one who's worthy of all praise in his hand of death and hell, and in his name, a power that can heal, and by his blood, our sins are washed away. Sound and every knee will bow, and 
tongue confess the name above all names. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. His name is wonderful counselor, the Almighty.
center our, our thoughts and our attention on you in this moment. Each one of us comes in here today with different situations, different things that we carry. And so Lord, we just cry out to you and we ask for your help. Help us to see you. can see you. Let us be close. As you are already here, let us just enter into your presence this morning.
Yes, all I am is yours. Lord, all I am is yours. Lord, this morning we stand in awe of you. We stand in awe that you, the great and glorious and marvelous King, the creator of the universe, has lavished such great love on each one of us. You have poured it out. You continue to pour it out in our lives each and every day. And so we are in awe of you. We worship you this morning. We give you praise and honor. And we just ask that you would continue to just reveal yourself to us today. Speak to our hearts, Lord. glorified in our midst today. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Be with us as we continue on through the service and through this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As you are finding your seats, I'm going to just invite you to greet a couple people around you. If you don't know them, get to know them a little bit. are not among us today, but they are in the presence of the Lord, and they're wrapping up uh, their final hours uh, in that time. And so we're knowing that God is doing some good things up there, and He's wanting to do some amazing things here as well. And so welcome. If this is your first time or one of your first times here, we would love to get to know you a little bit. Um, and so if you would like us to get to know you a little bit, we've got some ways that you can do that. There are some cards in the seats in front of you, or there's a QR code that's going to be on the screen, or there might be on the seats uh, in front of you as well. Uh, if you want to fill that out uh, with pen and paper, you can do that, or you can do it digitally. Um, that just gives us a way to get to know who's been with us and how we might be able to uh, walk with you in your journey and, and the things that you're going through. And so we want to be able to do that. And so thank you for being here. We think this is a good church family, um, and uh, it's a great place to be. So um, it would be great if you joined us, if that would be in your line of thought. Um, as well, we want to just dismiss our kids. Uh, so if you are in first through fifth grade, uh, we're going to send you off to a service that is just for you, where you get to hear the truth of God in, in, in a way that is, is, is good for you. And so we're excited for that. So kids... Have a fantastic time as you go to Kids Church. I'm going to invite our ushers as well to just make their way up so that we can take this morning's tithes and offerings. God is good, and he continues to do some great things uh, through this church, 
And so we're, a, we're thankful for how he blesses this church financially uh, through your tithes, through your offerings, through your giving of your first and your best, just honoring him. And so, Lord, we are grateful for how you continue to provide for this church family, how you have brought this church family together, and how this is a good place. This is a good place to worship. It is a good community of believers. And we attribute that fully and wholly to you. And so today, as we give our first and our best, we want to give you thanks and gratitude for all that you've done and all that you continue to do. We pray that this offering would just uh, be a, a sign of our, our heart toward you and worshiping you. Let your kingdom be advanced in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. While the ushers are taking up uh, the tithes and offerings, a couple of quick announcements for you to just be aware of. Um, again, if you are new or newer to Portview Church and would like to get to know us, we have an opportunity to do that above and beyond just filling out a connection card. We have a newcomer's brunch that's coming up uh, here in two weeks on Sunday the 28th. It will be right after service. Um, it is a way for us to get to know you. Um, sometimes we only get to like see you or maybe shake your hand real quick. Uh, but this is going to be a way that we get to just get to know you a little bit more. We get to uh, just talk with each other, uh, see who you are as a, as a person. You get to see who we are as people. Um, and so the staff uh, will be there. And we just look forward to that. It has always been a great time just to connect and just to get to know each other a little bit more. And so we invite you to sign up for that. Uh, you can do that either on the Church Center app or there is a sign-up sheet out in the Connection Center. Um, and so make plans to do that if you're new or newer to Portview. And then on Friday, May 3rd, uh, we have our next Forged Friday Night for Married Couples. Um, so this is a great way to just pour into your marriage. A, a great way to... Uh, think about some different concepts that we all face in our marriages and how we can apply them. And so th it is a time for you to come together. You'll hear a short teaching, and then there are some things that you get to go off and have a little date night with your, uh, your better half, uh, your spouse, and you get to uh, just spend some time talking about those things and really investing in your marriage. We, if, if we can do one major thing in this church, it is to build strong marriages and strong families. And so this is a great opportunity for you uh, to do that. So we invite you to be a part of that. If you have little ones um, and you would like to take advantage of child care, we just ask that you would sign up either, again, on the Church Center app. Um, and that just gives us a kind of a head count as far as how many we should prepare for. Um, but it is a great opportunity. So we invite you to be a part of that. You can find other things that are going on, either in our weekly emails or on the Church Center app um, or in the bulletin. And so we just encourage you to take advantage of all those things. Pastor Paul. I firmly declare it's spring. I, I don't know if that means anything. And uh, I, I, was, I was thinking about it today that it's so nice out. I think Christine and I are going to go for a walk or something because I was going to clean the garage and I just need an excuse not to clean the garage. And the weather is a great excuse. So let's read together in Philippians chapter 1, just verse 6. Where Paul says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paraphrasing, God is still working in us until he comes. God is still working in us until he comes. Let's pray. Let's ask God to guide us through this, this concept today in the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for this time together, time in the word. Time to be encouraged by you and by the story of a great pillar of our faith. And so guide us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If there was a degree in people watching, I think I've got a doctorate. I love people watching. As I get older, I like it more because the older I get, the stranger people get. And <laughs> am I right? Like, when I was young, we were all strange. But the older I get watching people, I enjoy it, you know. 
the best place in my life for, for watching people was at the airport in Kiev. Uh, because I, we spent so much time at that airport over the years, either flying in and out ourselves or picking people up. Um, God blessed us with a vehicle from Speed to Light, and so we were able to go all the way out outside of the city to the airport to do a lot of pickups through the years. And it is the greatest place to people watch because it is amazing the unique characters that come off of airplanes, right? And, and so I would often go, and you never kind of knew when people were coming out because uh, customs and passport control is just anarchy. You could, it could take you 10 minutes. It could take you 10 hours. Uh, it just dependent upon uh, really how they were feeling that day. And uh, so I would go and I would get an ice cream cone. That was my trick. I'd get an ice cream cone and I'd stand on the fence as people were just hundreds of people filing out of that, that airport. And I would just eat my ice cream cone and just try to figure out people. I'd try to figure out their stories, right? And uh, it's interesting because people would say, uh, Paul, can you go out and pick up, my, you know, my father-in-law is coming for a visit from the United States. Can you go pick him up? And I'd say, yeah, definitely. And they said, you want a picture of him? I said, no, I'll pick him out. I got it. It was almost like a little game I would play, right? Because Americans, we walk differently. We, we walk with our shoulders kind of up and we've got a purpose to where we're going, you know, and... Americans are the only people in the entire world that wears white tennis shoes. So you could sit at the, at the fence and just wait and go, American, 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 American. And we look each other in the eyes. And we chew gum all the time, right? We chew gum all the time. Other people, they don't chew gum, right? And so you could pick people up. But I loved hearing and seeing people's unique stories and knowing knowing that they have something different than I've ever experienced. Wondering what that is, how that all came to be. But here's, here's the other part, that even though each of us has, I guess, a, a different fingerprint, I, I don't know how we can make sure that ever happens, that everybody has a unique fingerprint, but we're all different. We're all created different. There are so many intersections in life that we have the same. We're all unique come from all over the world. On a Sunday in Ukraine, we had 40 different nationalities in the room uh, at our church, and yet we had so much alike, so many different cultures, so many different languages, so many different experiences, yet so much alike. In these few weeks, we're going through a series on pillars of our faith, individuals that through their lives, we can maybe learn a little bit about ourselves. And how faithful God is. We spoke first from an Old Testament character, Sarah. And then Pastor Mark spoke from a kind of a medieval focus of, uh, of Martin Luther. And today, I get a modern individual. And her name is Corey Ten Boom. An individual that maybe you know about and maybe you don't. But we have a lot to learn from her. And how she was able to live out a life for Christ that was different maybe than any of us would have ever thought about or experienced. I'm going to try my best to tell her story today before we really get into the Word of God. Her story is complex. Her story is unique. None of us have gone through what Corey went through, and yet we can learn from her. I've spent the last few weeks watching videos and reading her book, The Hiding Place. Uh, I've spent so many times listening to messages that she has given about her life and her experiences, that I feel like I know her, and I've never met her. And so I'm going to do my best to, to tell her story, and I may do a little bit more reading to try to stay to it. But April 15, 1892, Cornelia Arnolda Johanna Corey Ten Boom was born in Harlem, Netherlands. That's not Harlem, New York. Harlem, Netherlands. And uh, Corey had a strong Christian upbringing, her father and mother were devout uh, Dutch Reformed Christians. Uh, her father, Casper, every single morning would come up from the workplace on the first floor of their house where they, they had a watchmaking business. He would come up and at 8, 10 in the morning, he would sit at the table in the kitchen where he was born. And he would open up the Bible and all the employees and all the children and anybody who was staying in the house would all come down and every morning... They read scripture together. 
They spent time in the Word together, and the family learned about the patterns of living for Christ. Corey had a strong Christian upbringing. Corey and her sister Betsy were the closest friends. They grew up together upstairs from that family business, and that family business in the 1940s had been in place over 100 years. Casper, the father, at that point had been a watchmaker for 60 years. And so they knew their business. They grew up together in that upstairs area in 1921. Corey's mother passed away. Willem, their brother, got married. And the three of them were left in the business. They would uh, get up every morning, prepare, read scripture together. Corey would go down and work in the watchmaking business with the three other older gentlemen there. And she was the first licensed watch repair female in the country. Dad, every Monday, would pack his suitcase and he would get on the train. He would go to Amsterdam and he would go to the astronomical clock and he would set his watch to that clock and he would come all the way back and set the clock in the window so everybody in town could set their watches by that clock. They were a steady family that was celebrated in their community. They were loved. They were cared for. Betsy cooked while, while uh, Corey was downstairs working, and they always had guests. In fact, in those early years, a lot of the guests that they had were missionary kids, which I appreciate because my kids were missionary kids for years. But they would take in the children of missionaries that their church would send out into very complex places, and they'd watch the kids for months on end and care for them. And so their house was always full of relatives, people bustling, people needing a place to stay. Corey would have a significant boyfriend. In fact, so significant, they were talking marriage. They were excited to get married. And uh, in her young life, they had dated for many years. But because of the pressure that the, the young man's parents gave, he decided to marry someone else. And she was heartbroken. She was really heartbroken. She uh, then realized that maybe that God was asking her to live a single life, committed to ministry. In fact, later, as she would speak about these years of being alone, she talked about having, having to surrender the if-onlys in her life. I don't know if you've ever had an if-only before. If only I had done this, right? If only I had bought Bitcoin in 2000. I mean, come on. Right? I'd, I don't know Zaki County right now. Not so much financial, but we all have these if-onlys. If only I had done this, if only I hadn't done this. Right? And she realized early in her life that, that if only I had gotten married, she didn't need any more. And she gave her life to the service of God. Corey, in fact, started a youth group that she ran for decades out of her church. And not only did she run that youth group, but she ran a group that was a Bible study for individuals with disabilities, both physical and cognitive disabilities. And so she cared for people around her on a constant basis, always serving, always loving, faithful to her work until something changed. May 10th, 1940, Nazi Germany invaded the Netherlands. Up to this point, the Netherlands had tried to stay very neutral. In fact, World War I, they had stayed completely neutral, tried to stay apolitical, and, and they were never really bothered. And so they tried to take that posture again, only Germany had other plans. And so Nazi Germany came in and in five days overtook the country. The, their, their, their army fell and the occupation that would last over four years started in the Netherlands. Now, because of their faith, they decided they would try to stay as apolitical as they could, try not to deal with anything, try to stay to themselves, quiet, run their business, good Christians. But something inside of them struggled when they started seeing the deportation of all of their friends, the deportation of her small group, her Bible study of individuals with disabilities being sent off to 
concentration camps. When she saw the Jewish families around them in question being taken away, they decided to stand up. Corey specifically was asked, will you house a family? Will you bring a family in, Jewish individuals who are hiding at this time? And that's when, in the 1940s, they took in their first family that they hid in the Dutch underground resistance. Corey believed that she needed to do more, that she needed to create a place of hospitality and care for those who were running, those who were hiding. And in the following years, a total of 100,000 Jews were taken out of the Netherlands and into concentration camps. Best estimations, only about 5,200 of the 100,000 that were taken out of the country would survive. All the rest would be lost. Corey was given that opportunity to help and protect that Jewish family. Casper and Betsy decided to take them in. Corey was around 50 years old at this time, and she was given this opportunity because she knew how to care for people, how to love people, and, and she became a stop in what was called the Bayet House, the house with the, with the clock store in the base, and upstairs two more stories of bedrooms, became a stopping point in the railroad, bringing Jews and hiding them from house to house till they could get out of the country. Many came through their house over the years. That Bayet house became a place of safety, a place of comfort. Conveniently, Casper, years before seeing an opportunity, had purchased right behind their row, row house, which uh, uh, the Bayet house is like a row house. It's really small. They purchased the house behind them that was abutting the back of their house, and he tore down walls and put in staircases, so he put the two houses together that were quite large. But the interesting thing is the two houses didn't really line up very well, and so one side would have, be higher than the other from, the, from floor to floor. So staircases went down into the other house. Conveniently, if you look up at the top, you see Corey's room up there. In the back, there was an additional space behind, behind the, the closet. And that became their hiding place. The hiding place for people that would come through, that would go from home to home. They would find a place right through the closet. It was a hole at the floor of the closet that up to six people could hide behind the closet, behind a, a, uh, a wall built of brick. And right in Corey's room, people hid in that back closet. In fact, they got so good at it over the years that anybody who came in the door that was suspicious or asked questions, uh, Casper had a little buzzer underneath his desk that he would press that would buzz on the third floor and everybody would rush to the hiding place. And they would hide. In the four years that Casper and Betsy and Corey were hiding Jews in this underground railroad, 800 people hid in the hiding place. 800 people they protected over those years, keeping them safe, keeping them protected. But it was hard. It was hard feeding all these people. You see, the Netherlands was on a rationing of food, and so every person got a food voucher. And so they had food enough for three people, and Corey realized very early on, there's no way we can take care of all of these people coming through our home, coming through the Bayet house, with just three voucher cards to feed them all. So after a season of prayer, after a time of prayer with the youth group that she led, after a time of prayer with her dad and sister, she boldly went to the individual who distributes the vouchers. And he asks, how many are in your family? How many vouchers do you need? And she said, 103. His name was Fred. She, they've never met before, but she, with a gleam in her eye, just said, I need 103. And he gave her 103. Later that day, he asked his best friend to beat him up. And his friend beat a tar out of him, put him in the hospital, and he said, Someone stole the vouchers. And she had a hundred vouchers to pay for and take care of those in need. Not only were there Jews that they hid, not only did she hide them away, but uh, 
German soldiers. German soldiers who had just had enough, no longer wanted to be part of the evil regime, would come to her and say, I want out. She would take their uniforms and give them new clothes. She would hide them away in that hiding place as they went AWOL and ran from their, from their army. So she was caring for a lot of different people. At one point, the Dutch underground had found out that there were over a hundred Jewish babies that were being held in a local orphanage, soon to be sent off to a concentration camp as well. And they felt like they needed to do something. They needed to stand up, but they had these German soldiers' uniforms. And so she got all the young men from the church, and she dressed them all up. And she said, here's a document I made up. I want you to go in, and I want you to grab all 100 babies and bring them back. And that's exactly what they did. Miraculously, 100 babies were saved. She's a bold woman, but after four years... On the 28th of February, this gentleman, Jan Vogel, a Dutch informant, told the Nazis about the Ten, about the ten Boom's work. And at about 12.30 p.m. of that day, the Nazis arrested the entire Ten Boom family. And this was the last time that Betsy and Corey would see their dad. They were brought to both male and female concentration camps, they were separated immediately, and the last words from Casper, as he said goodbye to his two daughters, was from Psalms 91.1, when he said, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. In Ravensbrook, the sisters managed to stay together until Betsy died in December, just 10 months later. Heartbroken and not knowing what to do next, she was called into the offices of the concentration camp at the end of December when they informed her that paperwork had come in and she was being released. A clerical error that to, this, to the end of her days she never even knew why it happened or how it happened but she was released at the end of December and quickly fled the country. The camp administrator, still not knowing why they let her go, she had her freedom. Corey, now close to the end of World War II, would go on in her single life. She'd go on into a ministry telling her story. Telling the story of the hiding place, about the opportunities that she had to take as a follower of Jesus, that she was sensing the need to do something more. And for, until she was 91 years old, she died in 1978, living in California, always telling a story of grace, about faith in action, and a story of forgiveness. Today I want to just talk about some biblical truths that are lived out in the life of Corey Ten Boom. Things that we already see in scripture, but we saw in her life. And maybe we can see some intersections for ourselves where we're being challenged. First, she lived for what is right, not just opinions of what was wrong. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save, the, save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. James is telling us that our faith is not meant to be a private or unknown thing to the people around us. That what is happening spiritually inside of us should leak out. It should leak out in such a way that our lives are different 
than the people around us because our good deeds shine so bright. Corey could have stayed quiet. In fact, they could have just stayed hidden and done nothing. But they had to do something. They had to do something to make a difference. Now, I have found that in our season today of social media, in our season of being able to communicate through internet and on our phones, being access to everything, people have a lot of opinions. Have you ever noticed that people have opinions that they're willing to say online that they'd never say to your face? And the worst part is you can never truly hear a person's voice, right? I was texting somebody this week, and he said, oh, why are you speaking to me so harsh? And I'm like, I wasn't, <laughs> right? But the text, you can't even tell, like, the heart behind it or, you know, so much communication is physical, right? We communicate far more with our bodies than we do with our mouth when we're talking to somebody. And, and because of that, our social media has just blown up into this angry environment. And... I have perceived that we as a church feel like our opinions online is our faith in action. I don't think so. Our strong opinions are important. Our strong opinions are important to stand up to things. But what is the life that we live? We battle and we fight for things that we believe are so important. But do we live them? The Bible is the inerrant word of God. But do we read it? Why was prayer taken out of the schools? What is prayer in our homes? How can the government change, shut down church? Any opportunity on a sunny day to miss church do our lives reflect what's really important to us or is it just opinion? It would have been very easy for Corey to simply have opinion and talk amongst her church friends. This is horrible that's happening. I'm so upset with it. But she was willing to do something. Now you and I will never be put into, we pray, never be put into Corey's position. But each and every day, we have opportunities to reflect Christ. To do what Jesus would do. That our actions would show something and reveal something. Corey would go on to be a prolific writer. So many books. And I, I read the, the autobiography, The Hiding Place. Great book. Uh, read many of other things. Listened to some of her messages as well. Let me give you some of her quotes that came as she experienced the actions of faithfulness. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. That's a good one. Forgiveness is an act of the will and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. This is what the past is for. Every experience God gives us, every person he puts in our lives, is the perfect preparation for the future that only he can see. Deep waters. Worrying is carrying tomorrow's load with today's strength, carrying two days at once. It is moving into tomorrow ahead of time. Worrying doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. If you look at God, you'll be at rest. How many of you have heard that one before? Hold everything in your hands lightly. Otherwise, it hurts when God pries your fingers open. You can never learn that Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. 
a depth within her that came from an experience of living out her faith, even though her faith came through some very, very difficult times. She also had compassion without limitations. 1 Timothy 2.4 puts it this way, I urge then, first of all, that all petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peacefully and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior. Here's the important one now that's going on. Who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Their desire, God's desire is for all people. Not an us and them, all people to know him even those who would persecute, even those who would give harm, even those who would hurt. It's interesting, Betsy had a dream while they were in the concentration camp. Corey wrote about it. Betsy's dream was this. She wanted to start a retreat center when the war was over. A retreat center for Ger German soldiers who were living with shame and regret. Think about that. While she was in the concentration camp, Betsy's dream is, how can we care for these people who are hurting us so bad? Yeah, it seems like there's an us in them often, ideologically. But Luke 23, 4, Jesus on the cross, those who were hurting him, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And finally, her forgiveness defined her life with Christ. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus lives in us as followers of him. He takes up residency here, and we don't live anymore, but he lives through us. And guess what Jesus is really good at? Forgiveness. Even, even though people don't always, people never deserve it. Some harsh things you think, well, that's a little bit too much. But yet Christ's forgiveness is strong enough. Corey would struggle with the next verse from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's a hard one, isn't it? Because there are some people in our lives that are often very hard to forgive because they've done some horrible things. No questions. Horrible things. But the struggle of how we forgive, and not saying what they did was right, but release ourselves of the bitterness, is what Christ does. He forgives us. So in my process, as we close, I thought it really suiting because we have a modern character here for us to take a little over two minutes right now and hear it from Corey's own words. We're going to watch a video, and for those of you who have a difficulty hearing her accent, the, the words are going to be up on the screen as well. But hearing from her own voice, maybe what I've seen as being one of the most difficult struggles of forgiveness, and yet finding God faithful. Are we ready? It was some time ago that I was in Berlin. And there came a man to me and said, Ah, Mr. Bohm, I am glad to see you. Don't you know me? And suddenly I saw that man that was one of the most cruel officers, guards, in the concentra in concentration camp. And that man said, I have, I'm now a Christian. I have found the Lord Jesus. I read my Bible and I know that there is forgiveness for all the sins of the whole world. Also for my sins. I have forgiveness for the cruelties I have done. But then I have asked God grace 
for an opportunity that I could ask one of my very victims forgiveness. And Fräulein Tambom wants him here forgiven. Will you forgive me? And I could not. I remembered the suffering of my dying sister through him. But when I saw, when I experienced that I could not forgive, suddenly I knew I myself have no forgiveness. Do you know that Jesus has said that? When you do not forgive those who have sinned against you, my heavenly Father will not forgive you your sins. And I, I knew, oh, I am not ready for Jesus coming because I have no forgiveness for my sins. But I was not able, I could not, I could only hate him. And then I took one of these beautiful texts, one of these boundless resources, Romans 5.5. 5. The love of God is shed abroad into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. And I said, thank you, Jesus, that you have brought into my heart God's love through the Holy Spirit who has given to me. And thank you, Father, that your love is stronger than my hatred and unforgiveness. That same moment, I was free. And I could say, brother, give me your hand. And I shook hands with him. And it was as if I felt God's love stream through my arms. You never touch so the ocean of God's love as that you forgive your enemies. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. We're going to close in just a time of reflection and a time of prayer. Strong words. I can't imagine being confronted in a moment with a decision of forgiveness like that. But recognizing God's love flowing through her sufficient for the need. That God would so transform her heart in those moments to be able to do that. I don't know if forgiveness is the issue that we all have that we struggle with unforgiveness in others. I know there are times in my life I have. And to be honest with you, there's been a situation in my life where I struggled with forgiveness. And I believe that I overcame it. I believe that I forgave that person by hurts. And then a couple years later, I start thinking about it. And sure enough, that unforgiveness kind of boils back up inside of me. I get angry and bitter again. Again, I have to give it to God. But I wonder if your faith is revealed in your actions. I ask that of my own self once in a while. You think, you're a pastor? Just because you stand up in front of people doesn't mean that your actions are not challenged on a regular basis about your faith. Every pastor. Do people see and experience Jesus in your life? What a story. What a story Corey had. You know you have a story do you know you have a way in your life the life you've already led the life you will lead to so represent Christ that lives will be changed 800 individuals came through that hiding place those 100 babies who knows where they all ended up because she was bold for her faith. Are you bold for your faith? Would you stand with me? Just three questions for you today. And I'm going to ask our 
prayer team to come. I'll be joining them in prayer in just a moment. We're going to sing a song together as we close. Do you need revival? That's a word that's often used in evangelical circles, meaning that uh, maybe a part of our lives isn't what it used to be, and we need a new life. Revival means life, right? I need my, I need real life. I need new life inside of me. In fact, in Revelations at one point, uh, the vision comes that in Laodicea, they had lost their first love, right? Maybe you feel like you need a little revival in your heart. Now, personally, I'm more about revival. I don't want my life needing to be revived. But there's some times that it does. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you're going through the motions and you need a new life to regain your first love. Don't leave here today without that. Your family. Maybe patterns at home need to change. Things need to be renewed. Third, maybe just as we see about uh, from the Sermon on the Mount, maybe we just need to shine a little brighter. And you're asking of the Lord, work through me. Could my life still make a difference? You say, yeah, no idea how much your life. Put it in God's hands, and who knows what he would do with it. Your life is unique. God has a plan for you. So let's sing this song together. If you want to come for prayer, come for prayer. But would you close your eyes as we sing, and would you ask, do I need revival? Do I need new life? Do I need renewal? Do I need to change some patterns in my life? Or, Lord, how can I shine for you so that my life can make a difference? Heavenly Father, these moments we had together, thank you for them today. And as we worship together this song, we offer to you our lives. I want more of Jesus. So Lord, come, revive us, renew us. Help us to shine in you, we pray in Jesus' name.
hope is that you leave here with some sense of an action plan of maybe how God wants to adjust our lives to more reflect Him. Our prayer team will be here and we'll continue to worship as I pray you feel released into your beautiful weather today. Would you please stay behind and visit for a few minutes in the, in the cafe. We pray for your week. Heavenly Father, as our lives come into these points of opportunity where we make a decision how we live our lives, where we make decisions on how our family lives, Lord, would you give us a sense of your Holy Spirit's guidance so that we live for you. Lord, if there's someone we need to forgive, help us to forgive. Help us to have the strength and the love for them, though they don't deserve it. But Lord, you give that to us, though we don't deserve it. So this week, as we go out, help us to shine. Help us to be a city on a hill. Bless you, poor of you. Have a wonderful week.
Savior. Uh...